Wilma Unlimited, How Wilma Rudolph Became the World's Fastest Woman by Kathleen Krull, illustrated by David Diaz. Wilma Unlimited. No one expected such a tiny girl to have a first birthday. In Clarksville, Tennessee in 1940, life for a baby who weighed just over four pounds at birth was sure to be limited. Um, back then they had, they didn't have incubators or anything for tiny babies. They usually died if they were born too small. Most babies didn't have 19 older brothers and sisters to watch over them. Most babies didn't have a mother who knew home remedies and a father who worked several jobs. Most babies weren't Wilma Rudolph. Wilma did celebrate her first birthday and everyone noticed that as soon as this girl could walk, she ran or jumped instead. She worried people though. She was always so small and sickly. If a brother or sister had a cold, she got double pneumonia. If one of them had the measles, Wilma got the measles too, plus mumps and chicken pox. Her mother always nursed her at home. Doctors were a luxury for the Rudolph family. And anyway, only one doctor in Clarksville would treat black pe people. Just before Wilma turned five, she got sicker than ever. Her brothers and sisters heaped all the family's blankets on her, trying to keep her warm. During that sickness, Wilma's left leg twisted inward and she couldn't move it back. Not even Wilma's mother knew what was wrong. The doctor came to see her then. Besides scarlet fever, he said, Wilma had also been stricken with polio. In those days, most children who got polio either died or were permanently crippled. There was no cure. The news spread around Clarksville. Wilma, that lively girl, would never walk again. But Wilma kept moving any way she could. By hopping on one foot, she could get herself around the house, to the outhouse in the backyard, and even on Sundays to church. Wilma's mother urged her on. Mrs. Rudolph had plenty to do, cooking, cleaning, sewing patterned flower sacks into clothes for her children, now 22 in all. Yet twice every week, she and Wilma took the bus to the nearest hospital that would treat black patients, some 50 miles away in Nashville. They rode together in the back of the bus, the only place blacks were allowed to sit. And you know who helped change that, I hope. Doctors and nurses at the hospital helped Wilma do exercises to make her paralyzed legs stronger. And at home, Wilma practiced constantly, even when it hurt. To Wilma, what hurt most was that the local school wouldn't let her attend because she couldn't walk. Tearful and lonely, she watched her brothers and sisters run off to school each day, leaving her behind. Finally, tired of crying all the time, she decided she had to fight back somehow. Wilma worked so hard at her exercises that the doctors decided she was ready for a heavy steel brace. With that brace supporting her leg, she didn't have to hop anymore, and school was possible at last. Here's the brace on her leg. But it wasn't the happy place she imagined. Her classmates made fun of her brace. During playground games, she could only sit on the sidelines, twitchy with impatience. She studied the other kids for hours, memorizing moves, watching the ball zoom through the rim of the bushel basket that they used for a hoop, and Wilma fought her sadness by doing more leg exercises. Her family always cheered her on, and Wilma did everything she could to keep them from worrying about her. At times, it seemed like her leg was getting stronger, and other times, it just hurt. One Sunday on her way to church, Wilma felt especially good. She and her family had always found strength in their faith and church was Wilma's favorite place in the world. Everyone she knew would be there talking and laughing and praying and singing. It would be just the place to try the bravest thing she had ever done. She hung back while people, while people feel, filled the old building and standing alone, the sound of hymns coloring the air she unbuckled her heavy brace and set it by the church's front door. 
Taking a deep breath, she moved one foot in front of the other with her knees trembling violently. She took her mind off her knees by concentra concentrating on taking another breath and then another. And there she goes. Whispers rippled through the gathering. Wilma Rudolph was walking. Row by row, heads turned toward her as she walked alone down the aisle. Her large family, all her family's friends, everyone from school, each person stared wide-eyed. The singing never stopped, and it seemed to burst right through the walls and into the trees. Finally, Wilma reached a seat in the front and began singing, too, her smile triumphant. Wilma practiced at walking as often as she could after that, and when she was 12 years old, she was able to take that brace off for good. She got the brace, she got polio when she was four, and she had to wear a brace until she was 12 years old. Can you believe that? She and her mother realized she could get along without that brace, so one memorable day, they wrapped that hated brace in a box and mailed it back to the hospital for someone else to use. As soon as Wilma sent that box away, she knew her life was beginning all over again. After years of sitting on the sideline, Wilma couldn't wait to throw herself into basketball, the game she most liked to watch. She was skinny, but no longer tiny, and her long, long legs would propel her across the court and through the air, and she knew all the rules and all the moves. In high school, she led her basketball team to one victory after another, and eventually she took the team all the way to the Tennessee State Championships. And there, to everyone's astonishment, her team lost. Wilma had become accustomed to winning. Now she slumped on the bench, all the liveliness knocked out of her. But at the game that day was a college coach. He admired Wilma's basketball playing, but he was especially impressed by the way she ran. He wanted her for his track and field team, and with his help, Wilma won a full athletic scholarship to Tennessee State University. She was the first member of her family to go to college. Eight years after she mailed that brace away. Okay, so she was eight, she was 12 when she mailed the brace away. And now eight years later, Wilma's long legs and years of hard work carried her thousands of miles from Clarksville, Tennessee. The summer of 1960, she arrived in Rome, Italy to represent the United States at the Olympic Games as a runner. Just participating in the Olympics was a deeply personal victory for Wilma, but her chances of winning a race were limited. Simply walking in Rome's shimmering heat was a chore. Athletes from all the other countries had run faster races than Wilma ever had, and women weren't thought to run very well. Track and field was considered a sport for men. And the pressure from the public was intense. For the first time ever, the Olympics would be shown on television, and all the athletes knew that more than 100 million people would be watching. Before that, they just had to listen to it on the radio. They couldn't watch it on TV. Worst of all, Wilma had twisted her ankle just after she arrived in Rome, and it was still swollen and painful on the day of her first race. Yet... Once it was her turn to compete, Wilma forgot her ankle and everything else. She lunged forward, not thinking about her fear, her pain, or the sweat flying off her face. She ran better than she had ever run before, and she ran better than everyone, than anyone else. Grabbing the attention of the whole world, Wilma Rudolph of the United States won the 100-meter dash. No one else even came close. An Olympic gold medal was hers to take home. So, when it was time for the 200-meter dash, Wilma's graceful long legs were already famous. Her ears buzzed with the sound of the crowd chanting her name, and such support helped her ignore the rain that was beginning to fall. At the crack of the starting gun, she surged into the humid air like a tornado, and when she crossed the finish line, she had done it again. She finished far ahead of everyone else, and she earned her second gold medal. Wet and breathless, Wilma was exhilarated by the double triumph and the crowd went wild. 
the 400-meter relay race was yet to come, and Wilma's team faced the toughest competition of all. As the fourth and final runner on her team, it was Wilma who had to cross the finish line. So, on a relay team, you always want your fastest runner to be last so that they can catch up in case they're behind. And Wilma's last. So they're passing the baton. Wilma's teammates ran well and passed the baton smoothly and kept the team in first place. Wilma readied herself for the dash to the finish line as her third teammate ran toward her. She reached back for the baton and nearly dropped it. And as she tried to recover from that fumble, two other runners sped past her. Wilma and her team were now suddenly in third place. Well, ever since that day she had walked down the aisle at church, Wilma had known the power of concentration. Now, with legs pumping, she put her mind to work, and in a final electrifying burst of speed, she pulled ahead. By a fraction of a second, she was the first to blast across the finish line. The thundering cheers matched the thundering of her own heart. She had made history. She had won for an astounding third time. At her third ceremony that week, as the band played the Star Spangled Banner, Wilma stood tall and still like a queen with the last of her three Olympic gold medals hanging around her neck. Wilma Rudolph, once known as the sickliest child in Clarksville, had become the fastest runner in the world. And that is the story of Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Unlimited.